sister in Philadelphia, parents and guardians. I hope you and your family are staying safe and feeling well. I'm so Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Academy. Um, my name is Eunice Sinyan, and I am a FACE coordinator for the Philadelphia School District. I'm accompanied today by Maimona Fay, who is one of our family engagement liaisons. Um, Maimona, say hi to everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Maimona Fay. I'm one of the liaison, family liaison. Great. So um, before we get started, I'm going to go over some norms for this session. So we are going to utilize the chat box. So um, for any questions, um, we are going to communicate with Ms. Faye via the um, chat box. Audio and video will be muted by the host to respect the privacy of others, and so that we are giving our full attention to the speaker um, for our session. Any follow-up questions can be sent to ask at philasd.org. And then future webinars can be found at www.philasd.org uh, backslash face backslash fact. And last but not least, this session um, is being recorded uh, so that you can access it for future use. So today's session is Fostering Caregiver Child Communication, Sexuality and Sexual Health. And it's being um, presented by the um, elect office. And I am going to stop sharing my screen where Natoya Brown is going to take over and be our facilitator for this evening. Hello, folks, and thank you, Eunice, for the introduction. Um, so both Taylor Harrigan and myself will be co-facilitating. Um, so I'll introduce myself first, and then Taylor is welcome to do so. Um, so my name is Natoya Brown, and I am a coordinator for the Outreach and Information Services Program at Access Matters. Access Matters is a sexual and reproductive health nonprofit, and pretty much what we do as a whole is we manage the clinics in Philadelphia and the surrounding counties that offer sexual and reproductive health services under Title X. Really briefly, if you're not familiar, Title X is basically a grant that allows um, folks to access sexual and reproductive health care at low cost. Um, particularly if they're uninsured. So we manage a lot of clinics that receive those funds. I work primarily on the Access Matters hotline. It's a hotline that folks can call, teens, adults, um, both can call if they need sexual health referrals to those participating clinics or if they need any kind of sexual or reproductive health counseling. Um, so we talk to folks a lot about their birth control options, prenatal care, STI and HIV testing, risk assessment, um, we help connect folks to clinics um, so that they can get the care that they need. Um, and like I said, it's short-term counseling um, as well as referrals. Um, also on the hotline, we do a lot of community outreach and education. So we do a lot of workshops like these for um, you know, neighborhood nonprofits, um, neighborhood organizations that serve youth and families. Um, we also provide safer sex materials to those organizations if they need them to distribute. Um, so that's pretty much what we do in a nutshell. And I'll let Taylor tell you folks a little bit about PASH. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Harrigan. I'm the Assistant Program Coordinator for the District's PASH program. 
PASH stands for Promoting Adolescent Student Health. And let me tell you a little bit about this program. So it is the district's um, HIV, STI, and Unintended Pregnancy Prevention Program. It is a five-year grant. Um, this grant has been with the district um, for quite some years. So I think um, this is like our fifth time getting this grant. And some of the big things that we do with this grant is that we provide evidence-based curriculum, we provide technical assistance, um, workshops like this one, and also professional development opportunities um, to district staff and teachers to help build their capacity um, to have um, these conversations with students about sexual health. Now, we do this work through three core strategies, the first one being sexual health education. And this is very important because it helps to um, make sure students acquire the knowledge and the skills needed um, to help prevent HIV, STDs, and unintended pregnancy. And we do this by making sure that um, the lesson objectives, um, the learning objectives, lessons, materials, everything that goes into our curriculum um, helps to equip the students to do that. And the curriculum that we have selected, which is the first time the district has ever had um, the same sexual health curriculum being utilized K through 12, it's called the three R's, which stands for rights, respect, and responsibility. This curriculum was um, designed by Advocates for Youth. Um, this curriculum is, um, this curriculum is K through 12, it's, it's been checked and vetted for medical accuracy, age appropriateness and inclusivity. And this was done through the district, through the district SHAC, which is the School Health Advisory Council. And um, this includes um, community stakeholders, um, teachers, district staff and parents. Um, so we're very, very excited that we have um, this curriculum. And this curriculum also meets the national sexuality education standards. Okay, another core strategy is um, making sure that students have access to key preventative sexual health services. So this, this is like making sure that students um, can get tested for um, STIs and HIV. So I do, So one of the things that we do is we partner with DPH to make sure that we have STI testing days in the high school. Um, there's also the condom availability program um, in our high schools. And then also we make sure that students have access to counseling about preventative behaviors, which is what we partner with Access Matters with, with our health resource centers that are in, um, of quite, I wanna say 17 of our high schools. And then the last one is safe and supportive environments. And this is um, to ensure that we focus on those protective factors within the school and family environments that help to reduce HIV, SEIs and unintended pregnant pregnancy. And this is through school connectedness, um, parental monitoring and parent adolescent communication. Um, generally and specifically about sex. So this workshop is a prime example of that. We really want to help make sure that we equip um, our families to be able to have conversations about sex. And this is just a little bit more background information about Access Matters. So as I mentioned, um, we do a lot as far as the training and education and, and monitoring the actual clinics in the city and surrounding counties that provide sexual health services. Um, but we do some direct service work, like I mentioned on the hotline, which I primarily work on. Um, you'll receive information um, as far as like the hotline number. And we also have a text line. It'll be listed at the end of the presentation. And also you will either receive materials or have already received materials um, with just a lot of different sexual health support and resources, including ours. So feel free to reach out at any time.
And this is a bit of um, our agenda. Um, we're gonna try to get through as many of these activities as we can. Um, just full disclosure, this is um, a full workshop that was edited down from an hour and a half. So we tried to make it just a little bit more friendly to people's attention spans and taking into account that um, a lot of folks are experiencing screen fatigue and Zoom fatigue just because everything is virtual due to COVID. Um, so we did try to condense a lot of this down to an hour, but we'll be going through um, a few different activities, about three activities in addition to an icebreaker um, that'll just hopefully give us a chance to kind of talk about different trends when it comes to teen sexuality and behavior, um, some statistical information. Um, we'll be doing some practicing as far as kind of building confidence and um, preparing folks to actually have these conversations with teenagers and be ready for these conversations. Um, I do like to put out that this workshop isn't meant to make anyone like a sexual health expert. So we're not expecting anybody who participates in this workshop to be able to talk about birth control in detail. Um, we'll be providing a lot of resources if you kind of want to educate yourself on that in the future, but that's not what this workshop is about. It's about more so just giving you the tools that you may need to start these conversations, try to eliminate some of that discomfort and awkwardness that can come up with sexuality, particularly when it's in reference to um, young people that are in our care that we mentor. Um, so that's what we'll be doing um, over the course of the next hour. Okay, so for our first activity, it's more so an icebreaker just to kind of help everyone get comfortable talking about sexuality because as I mentioned, it can be a very awkward and uncomfortable conversation depending on folks' different backgrounds and where they're coming from. Um, so this is just to kind of get the gears turning on thinking back to as an adult um, when you were a teenager, the different messages that you may have received about sexuality. Um, so this will just help with us becoming more aware, more self-aware of kind of how our experiences influence the conversations that we have with young people or the way that we view sex in general. So the question is, what messages did you receive about the following? Condoms, people that identify as LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning um, for folks who may not know, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, virginity, you don't have to comment on all of those. But if anyone sticks out to you, like if any one of those topics sticks out to you, feel free to con comment on one or several. And just think about messages that you received either from the media, your friends and peers, family or faith-based organizations you may have been involved in. So think about those messages and then also think about how those messages may have changed for teens today because it's a different kind of world. Um, than existed for a lot of folks who are adults now. So think about how those messages may have changed for teens today. And um, we are open to either using the chat box if you feel more comfortable, um, but also we can unmute folks if they wanna comment and just share their, their thoughts aloud. So feel free to do either or if you're comfortable. So we have in the chat, um, Jennifer wrote, don't remember any messaging at all about LGBTQ, definitely receive education and information about birth control and condoms. Thank you, Jennifer, for commenting. And as folks are typing or thinking, I'll offer um, kind of my two cents. Um, so in reference to birth control, I think it was just more so get on it and don't get pregnant. Um, the messages that were going around were pretty short. Um, I would say also with virginity, there was this idea that it was just, you know, something very sacred, um, something that, you know, women were obligated to protect and, and keep um, as long as possible. Um, so those were a lot of the messages that came definitely from family, um, as well as the media. Mm -hmm. 
No, I definitely resonate with that. Um, there, this wasn't really something that was discussed in my household. It was just a mutual understanding with everyone just not to do it or not to talk about it. And in schools, it was main, it just focused on usage of a condom and birth control and making sure that if something happens, you minimally talk to your healthcare provider about it. Thank you, Taylor. And we'll also be talking about um, those conversations with health providers a little bit as we continue through the activities because that is a big part of this. So thank you all for sharing. And does anyone wanna talk about how those messages may have changed for teens today or if they've changed, maybe they remain the same? I'll say I definitely think it's a little more open where we're talking a lot more about these, these different things and we're telling people more is a little more open, but there are still families who have all different values where it, it just looks different for every household. True, thank you, Jennifer. I would agree. Um, definitely when it comes to things like virginity or even like LGBTQ, I feel like these things are more commonly discussed in the media, especially. Um, like Jennifer stated, it can change from household to household, but definitely the media, there's a lot more prevalence with just all of these topics being discussed and a little bit more widely accepted. I think um, folks are starting to normalize, like um, folks who identify as LGBTQ and it's more openly discussed. And even with virginity, it's more so looked at as, you know, kind of like a, a concept that folks can kind of approach in the way that they wish. It's not something that is like a, a possession. Um, that folks either have um, ownership over or not. It's more looked at as just kind of a state of being. Um, so I would agree with that. Anyone else? Okay, cool. So we can... Um, move on to the next activity, but that icebreaker was basically just to kind of keep in mind that as caregivers and um, parents that you are providing support and guidance in a world that may be completely different than yours and being kind of aware of the messages and the influences that surround young people today that may not have existed in the past or may have existed in a different way. So just being mindful of those things that, um, that may have changed and also staying in touch with what actually surrounds the, the young person that you're, you're giving guidance to, um, tapping into that and keeping your finger on the pulse. Um, so this next slide is benefits of parent-child communication. And we won't go through this detail for detail, um, but that basically, it's basically what this workshop is all about. It's kind of pointing out why talking to the youth in your life um, about sex as a positive thing and some of the, the positive benefits that can result from having open and honest conversation. Um, when I teach um, these types of workshops to parents, um, educators, I always um, am mindful to focus on the fact that these discussions should be kind of like a lifelong discussion. So it's not a discussion that necessarily starts boom at age 13 for young people. Um, it should be something that's normalized um, in a way that parents and caregivers feel comfortable from when children are very young, as long as it's, it's age appropriate. Um, and it helps to kind of facilitate those conversations. So when you do have a 13 year old that's coming to you about condoms and birth control, um, it's a little bit more normalized and they feel more comfortable coming to you because they've talked about names for proper anatomy and good touch, bad touch, even from when they're a child. Um, so when you start this conversation earlier, it makes it a lot easier to have on both parts for both the parent and caregiver and the child when they get a little bit older. Um, so some of the um, bullet points, just to point out real quick, the first one, young people report less depression and anxiety, more self-reliance and self-esteem than peers who don't discuss sex with parents. So it, it provides a lot of confidence for young people um, when they know they have ownership and agency over their bodies and helps with decision-making and support with decision-making and knowing that they can have a trusted adult um, that they can go to when it comes to these types of topics and, and questions. 
Um, some other good ones are, I would say that third one, when parents make consistent efforts to know their teens' friends, young people report fewer sexual partners, fewer coital acts, and more use of condoms and contraceptives. So when you have a parent or a caregiver that is showing active kind of interest and um, participation in their teens' life in general, um, it makes the conversations a lot more easier to have. Um, the second one also, I didn't mean to skip over that, um, studies that show adolescents who feel open to discussing sexual health with their parents are more likely to delay initiating sexual intercourse. So a lot of times, um, parents and caregivers may feel the opposite, that by starting these conversations, they're promoting and um, encouraging sexual activity when actual studies show that the opposite is true, that teens who have these conversations frequently with their parents are more likely to, to wait to have sex. Um, so these are just a few of the benefits. Um, like I said, we won't go through all of them, but those are a few of the, the most important ones. Okay. So before we jump into our next activity, we're going to start with a little questionnaire. Um, are we able to do these as polls, Taylor? Or Okay. So we will not be doing the poll, um, but feel free to type in the chat. We have a multiple choice question here. Um, and the question is, what percentage of teens aged 12 to 15 said that parents most influence their decisions about sex? So your choices are A, 15%, B, 85%, or C, 52%. And feel free to just type that in the chat when you feel ready. Okay, so it looks like we've got multiple answers. We've got an A, a B, and a C, so a few different choices. So the correct answer is actually C, it's 52%. Um, so teens age 12 to 15 said that, which is a nice amount, um, said that parents most influence their decisions about sex. So if we go to the next slide, I believe is the chart, yep. Um, this is all of this data or a lot of the data of this workshop is from Power to Decide which is an organization that does a lot of surveys on teen sexuality and behavior. Um, so this is from a survey that they did um, on that very question. And it looks like 52% of those teens would um, say that their parents heavily influence their decisions about sex, which can be both a good and a bad thing. And we'll talk about why. Um, but, and that's over friends. Um, if you see that in the blue, that's the next most popular. Then we have media. Um, I, I think a lot of um, parents and just the general public think media plays a lot more into teen decision making than it actually does. And then you can see the rest, religious leaders, um, someone else, friends, things of that nature. So friends and parents are the ones that obviously have the most influence, which is something that's good to know. For the second question that we have is what percentage of adults agree that sheltering in place during the COVID-19 pandemic has provided increased opportunities for conversations with young people in their lives about sex, love, relationships, and ultimately birth control? Um, so A, 57%, B, 85%, and C, 52%. So we have two, two people who selected A, 57%, one that selected 52%. Um, the correct answer is A, 57%. Um, now during the pandemic, because everybody is home, um, there's, is, there's, there's room and there's lots of opportunities to have these conversations that you may not normally have had if everything was what it once was. So it's a really good opportunity to sit down and actually um, talk about these difficult topics, um, especially in the pandemic. Um, it can be, it can be, it can be challenging sometimes to find that opportunity or find that window. So it's like, it's, this is a perfect opportunity to have those conversations. 
Yep, and to add to that, um, with the with COVID and everyone being at home together all the time, um, you know, it's important to find opportunities, like Taylor said, to have these conversations, things that you may not have considered before. So if you're watching a show with a young person and there's a sex scene that comes up or there's a character that identifies as LGBTQ, that could be a time to start a conversation. And um, it's also important to keep in mind that, especially when you're a parent or kind of a caregiver or guardian type of figure, even if you're the most um, open and honest and forthcoming that teen may still not want to have a conversation with you. That's very common because you're the person that is, is offering them guidance and, and, and parenting on a daily basis. And so kind of having to see that same person every day and talk about their own kind of personal sexual behavior and decisions can be awkward. Um, still not a reason to avoid these conversations, but just expect that it, it can be awkward. Um, so just finding those opportunities. And, and I feel like um, I hear from a lot of parents that even call the hotline that COVID um, has provided almost too much of an opportunity for them to witness kind of their teens behavior, whether it's conversations or, um, you know, seeing how much they are in their phones and in social media. Um, so just try to take advantage of, of moments when whenever possible. Um, this slide just um, covers teen ages 15 to 19 um, who talk with their parents. So um, for this slide, it just shows you that between um, men and women, uh, when they have these conversations, it increases their chance of saying no to sex, um, using some form of method of birth control, using a condom, and also knowing where to access birth control. So for this next activity, we're going to focus on just um, a few statistics that kind of talk about trends in teen sexuality and behavior. Um, I will warn you that a lot of this information is very data and statistic heavy, and I, for one, personally am not the biggest fan of statistics. I just hate anything that involves percentages and numbers. Um, and this isn't something that you'll necessarily um, need to quote word for word um, when it comes to having conversations with your team, but it's just good to have kind of that background knowledge. Um, and thank you for the question. We do see it and, and we can address that momentarily. Um, but we'll go to go over some of these statistics and then you know we can get to questions in due time and hopefully we'll have some time at the end. Um, so like I said, these statistics are more so to give you kind of background working knowledge of the, the trends and behaviors we see with teens and sexuality. Um, a lot of these um, statistics come from the Guttmacher Institute, which you're welcome to explore on your own. But as I said, it is very statistic heavy. So if you're not into that, it can be kind of, um, kind of tedious. Um, so what we'll do for this activity, we're going to go through each statistic and um, just try to keep these in mind. Um, you're going to either type in the chat box or you can feel free to openly discuss whether it's something that's a new fact to you, something you already know, whether it's surprising or disturbing. And it can be more than one of these. So, you know, we'll repeat these as we go through because it can be more than one. Um, but yeah, we'll just talk about kind of what you already know and, and have some discussions around kind of what we see in these statistics. So this first one, young women were more likely than young men to talk with their parents about sexual health topics such as where to get birth control, how to say no to sex, methods of birth control, STDs, how to prevent HIV infection, and how to use a condom. However, how to use a condom was the one topic more commonly discussed among males, 45% than females. So feel free to type in the chat box, whether it's a new fact to you, um, something you already knew, surprising, disturbing, or a few of those. And while we're waiting, um, I can address um, a question that did come in because it does relate to this slide. Um, should birth control be encouraged was the question. Um, it really is a personal decision that you have to kind of um, take into account your, your values as, as a parent or caregiver and your values as a family. Um, so I don't think giving information about birth control encourages it. 
Um, but it is letting the young person know that it is available. And another important thing to keep in mind is that um, in the state of Pennsylvania, when teens are 13, they can consent to their own sexual and reproductive health care services. So if they are interested in birth control, it is information and um, materials that they can access on their own without parental consent. But as far as having a conversation, I think there's a way to do that where you have a conversation about and you express your own values as a parent and your expectations, but also letting a young person know that it's available in there if they, you know, want to prevent STDs, unplanned pregnancy, and, um, you know, just practice safety and harm reduction in general. So giving information is not the same way, is not the same thing as encouraging a certain behavior activity. Um, at the end of the day, I think most parents and caregivers want their young people to be safe. And so the more information they have, the better equipped they are to make those decisions. And in the chat box, we have some folks already knew. So yeah, this just basically talks about how when it comes to birth control, um, it can be a very, it can be a conversation that's filled with double standards. Um, usually parents are having the conversations with their sons or, or, or males in the household about using a condom. Um, and because that's the only thing that males really have access to um, that they can use for themselves in terms of STDs, um, reducing STDs and unplanned pregnancy. Um, where to get birth control, all of those other things are typically more discussed with young women or daughters. And it does send the double standard message that the responsibility of preventing pregnancy falls on the person that is able to get pregnant. Um, and when we have these conversations, I would encourage folks to look at it a lot differently because if you have teens and want to equip them to be in healthy kind of consensual um, relationships that, you know, where they're supportive of their partners, um, then it's a conversation and a responsibility that needs to be shared by both people. Both people are involved in that experience. Um, so that just points out kind of the double standards that you know you see in a lot of these conversations. Okay, for this fact, the websites adolescents may turn to for sexual health information often often have inaccurate information. For example, of 177 sexual health websites examined in a recent study, 46% of these addressing contraception contain inaccurate information. So in the chat box, tell us, is this surprising? Is this something that you already knew? Is it disturbing? All right, so in the chat, we have someone who said they already knew. Another person that said they're surprised. The int what I will say about this is the internet is a very big place and you can find something about anything anywhere, which is great. However, it also leaves room for people to put up whatever they want up there. So it's very important that students know where they can um, get the information from, whether it be a trusted adult, their healthcare provider, or um, websites online. What's really cool about the three R's curriculum, there's actually a lesson that specifically speaks on this, and it tells um, students what to look for on these websites to know if it's a credible um, source. Uh, so making sure that they know um, what things to look for, like right out the gate. Um, is, it, is it a .org or is it a .com? Um, is it a healthcare provider providing this information? Is it a Title X provider providing this information? All of these things are very important to look for when you're trying to find a credible source. Okay, 
And this next one is many healthcare providers do not talk with their adolescent patients about sexual health issues during primary care visits. When these conversations do occur, they are usually brief. One study showed that conversations with patients aged 12 to 17 lasted an average of 36 seconds. So is that a new fact to you, something you already knew, surprising, disturbing, or a couple of those? You folks are surprised and disturbed. Cool. Um, so, yep, um, for anybody who's been to the doctor um, at any point, um, if it's a especially crowded day, which is usually the case with, for a lot of providers, um, you don't get a lot of, of time to talk um, in general, whether you're an adult or a teen, um, about sexual health issues. Um, they may ask you, is there anything that you're concerned about? And that's kind of where the conversation ends if you don't have anything that you're particularly concerned about. Um, one of the reasons for this is just that our healthcare in this country is just overwrought and overworked. And a lot of it is based on insurance and, and money. And they try to make the most of the time that they have. Um, what we do want to emphasize, particularly when we're talking to young people, is just finding providers that they are comfortable with, that um, respect their, their questions, their choices, and their knowledge of their own body, and kind of encourage these conversations. Um, 36 seconds is, is no time, and we really want to focus on kind of empowering youth to start these conversations if their providers don't do so. And if they do have a provider that isn't open to that, then finding another provider. So even on the hotline, we offer support and um, advocate so much for teens feeling comfortable to express themselves in, in doctor's offices and when um, communicating their concerns to healthcare providers. Um, as a parent, you may know that once a teen hits around 11 or 12, they may ask you to leave the room. Um, and this is for that conversation so that they can have some confidentiality. Um, a good thing to know is legally, when it comes to sexual rep and reproductive health, and I say legally because this isn't always what happens, but um, providers are um, required to keep that information confidential so they don't have to share um, things with the parent um, when it comes to sexual and reproductive health, um, unless it's a situation where the teen is, the teen is a, um, of harm to themselves or someone else. Um, so it's just important to keep that in mind um, that if they're asking you to leave the room, it's probably because they're just trying to give that teen some privacy so they can feel comfortable to ask these questions. And um, we want to encourage teens to take advantage of that because when it comes to these sexual health concerns, that's who they want to ask as a provider and specifically when they feel comfortable with. Okay. So next one is older adolescents are more likely to use prescription methods of contraception and condom use becomes less con common with age. So is this surprising to you? Is this disturbing? Is this something you already knew? All right, so we have a response in the chat. The person said that they found it surprising. This is very surprising. Like you, for the most part, you start out so strong, they're using condoms, they're using contraceptives. And then as time goes on, you'll see them begin to use condoms less and less, um, just because I feel like a lot of times the message is don't get pregnant don't, don't, you don't want to do it at a young age, you're not ready, you're not ready for that responsibility, the financial responsibility that comes with that. And the concern around getting HIV or an STI ends up way on the back burner. Um, 
So it's very important that adolescents understand that being sexually healthy is a lifelong thing. It's not just something where it's only at the beginning and as time goes on, you're going to have, you're not going to be at as high, you're not gonna be at risk as high as you once were. Um, this is something that um, even in the three R's that's covered throughout, like this is, this is all the time. This isn't just like a once and done. Okay. All right, for this one, it says as of 2017, fewer than 7% of queer students aged 13 to 21 reported that their school health classes had included positive re representations of LGBT related topics. Is this surprising, disturb, um, disturbing, something you didn't know, something you knew? For me, this was something that wasn't surprising. Um, even when I was in grade school and I did my sex ed um, classes, this was not something that was talked about or covered. Um, main thing was like, I was told is this is where babies come from. This are the things that you're at risk of having um, when you engage in sex. So we talked about HIV, all the STIs. We touched a little bit on birth control and how to access it, but to say that um, LGBT were talked about to say that um, what their experiences may have been was not covered or discussed. And I'll also add to this, um, it's important to note that because of this, um, LGBT or, you know, teens that identify as LGBT are more likely to turn to the internet for a sense of community, um, just because um, they may be in spaces where they don't feel like the re representation or support is there. So they're more likely to turn online, which is why it's even more important that they're turning to credible, supportive sources. Thanks, Antonia. All right, so here is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, we, administ we administer this um, every other year. Um, so we go into high schools and we ask students like a set of questions. And it's not just about sexual health, it's about a lot of different topics. But for right now, we're gonna talk about the things relating to sexual health. So here you can see that 41% of high school students had reporting um, have had sex. Okay, um, 51 of those students had reported um, saying that they did not use a condom during their last intercourse, um, which definitely, we, we already just went over a fact that touched on that. Um, older you, the, older, um, the older youth become, the less likely they are to use a condom. Um, we also have that most, we have 97% of those students who are sexually active did not use the most effective methods of birth control during their last intercourse. And if you combine both of those together, that is 93%. So there is a need um, for students to be having these con conversations um, regarding what it means to, to um, indulge in, um, I cannot English today, to, to make sure that they're being as safe as possible and protecting themselves. Yep, and like we mentioned, we'll have plenty of resources if you want to equip yourself on birth control and what's most effective and least effective. Um, there are plenty of resources for that. But even if you, you know, don't feel equipped to have that conversation, there's always resources that you can point them in the right direction. Yeah. All right, so we're just going to go through briefly some of the um, rights and responsibilities in PA. Um, for this one, this pertains to sex education. So for this one, it's a true or false. 
PA state law requires schools to provide education on STDs in HIV slash AIDS. So for this one, this is true. Um, the law does require schools to provide education on STDs in HIV and AIDS. Um, however, it's not required to provide comprehensive sex education that includes um, information on contraceptions, consent, healthy relationships. Um, all the materials does stress um, abstinence, and this is present in our three R's curriculum. Um, all of the information presented to the students must be age appropriate. Um, it, parents um, must have access to the, to the curriculum to be able to review those materials. Um, and also there is also parents have the option to opt out um, if, if the curriculum does not align with their values and beliefs. Thank you. I actually just had to go through that process with my six-year-old because they were talking about good touch and bad touch in class. And since it's hybrid, um, we had to do it separately. So it placed the responsibility on the parents to kind of have that conversation and they gave some guiding curriculum, but that it reminded me of this workshop and just parents, you know, being able to be confident and have the, the supports needed to, to start that conversation um, on their own. So, so yep, that is a thing. Okay, so this one has to do with consent and access to services. So for this one, for this true or false, it's teens ages 16 or over can legally consent to sexual activity with anyone they choose. So this one is false. Um, teens 16 or over cannot legally consent to sex with anyone who has authority over them. Um, meaning, so this can be like an employer, this can be a coach, this can be um, a teacher. So anyone who is above them, they cannot consent to having sex with. Um, children under the age of 13 also cannot consent to having sexual activity with anyone. Um, teens ages 13 to 15 can consent to having sex with someone who is no more than four years older than them. Okay. And then as mentioned before, um, Natoya touched on it, minors at the age of 13 um, can consent to their own sexual and reproductive health services um, um, with some exceptions. And we are also gonna have um, a handout that will go into depth and also tell you how you can get more information about this. So when it comes to this, I'll just add that PA law especially can be very confusing with the with the age part. Um, it's referred to as like the statutory rape law or the Romeo and Juliet law, um, just because those ages are so specific. Um, and the reason why it mentions like um, a 16 year old can consent to anyone except people that have authority over them is to kind of take into account situations where you have a teen and like a, a teacher or a teacher's assistant and maybe that teen is 16 but the teacher's assistant is like 18 and it's kind of a slippery slope. Um, so it strictly kind of prohibits that. Like um, if you're a teen and you're in a position where you are have a relationship with somebody that's an authority figure, it takes into account that because there's a power dynamic. Um, so you can come into a situation where a teen is involved in sexual activity that may be not consensual because there is that power dynamic. Um, so the law can be very confusing. Like I said, how this is actually pursued, pursued legally once it plays out can vary. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. And I like to mention, if you're going over this with your teen, um, I encourage folks to do it more so from the mindset of just knowing the law, but not using it to kind of deter them or make them afraid or ashamed. Um, because it's important to know legally what's acceptable, but if you're using it as a deterrent, most times studies show that it doesn't work. Teens are still going to do kind of what they intend to do. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to point that out that, you know, it can be very confusing. So if you want to read up on it, like Taylor mentioned, there is a handout and some resources for you. Okay, we kind of went over this. So this will be quick information teens share about their health during family planning visits must be kept confidential and cannot be shared without the teens consent. 
Um, so this is true. Um, like I said, if it comes to sexual and reproductive health services, so even if it is a primary care visit, like you take your 13 year old um, into the doctor about the flu, but they take a couple of minutes alone to ask them if they have any questions about sexual and reproductive health, that information does have to be kept confidential. Like I said, unless it proves that it's a harm to themselves or someone else. Um, there have been popular stories about this in media. If anybody's familiar with the rapper T.I. and his daughter and wanting kind of him wanting access to if she was a virgin or not, um, there was a lot of discussion around that. Um, so this is really meant to empower and protect young people so that they do have a safe space um, with another trusted adult where they can either ask questions or, you know, report things that, you know, might be an issue or a concern for them. So it's really meant to protect teens. So if you look at it in that way and not in a way where it's meant for them to keep information from you, because ultimately um, you want to encourage teens to have these conversations openly, but you also want to give them a space where if they can't, they still have a resource and a sense of support. Okay, and we're gonna just do this last one quickly and then um, we can probably just go into the practice scenario and leave time for questions, Taylor, if you think that works, just doing one scenario. Okay, so this last one is in PA team, parents are considered emancipated and their parents have no legal responsibility or authority over them. Um, so this is actually false. Um, I thought this was important to include just because um, in the city of Philadelphia, as well as you know, nationwide, we do have a lot of teen parents. And um, there's sometimes confusion because they are parents on what their parents' responsibility to them is. So in short, they can make decisions about their child's care. So their child's health care, daycare decisions, things of that nature, education. But if they're a minor, they're still under their parents' responsibility and care. So it doesn't just mean that because they're a parent, they're free to go off on their own and legally emancipated. Um, their parents still have some responsibility over them until the age of 18. Okay. Since we are down to our last 10 minutes, I think we can do... So we did have some values explorations activities, but um, in the respect for time, um, those activities are more so just exploring kind of your own values about sex, which we somewhat did in the beginning. So it's a little bit more of that, but we'll move into the having the conversation scenarios to give you all just a little bit of practice uh, when it comes to these conversations based off of what you already learned. Um, so we can do this pretty much as an open group since we um, don't have too many participants, if, they, if you feel like that works, Taylor? Yep, that's fine. Okay, and what we'll do is we'll just look at a scenario and either in the chat box or open discussion, we can talk about how as a parent, maybe things in that scenario could have been improved or different as far as the communication. Um, and we'll take a, just a look at kind of what's wrong and what worked well in that, in that situation or what could have been better. Do you want to read, Taylor? I can. I got it. Ava is 18 and has been dating her boyfriend for about a year. They have decided they want to start a family. And at a recent visit with her gynecologist, she asked the doctor for help tracking her cycle so she could begin trying to conceive. Her gynecologist's response was, you're such a smart girl. Why would you want to have a baby now? There's such a major responsibility. Ava knows that she and her boyfriend are ready to start a family and feels like the doctor doesn't know her well enough to try to con convince her otherwise. She decides to Google how to track her menstrual cycle instead. All right, so how do you feel this conversation could have gone differently? Um, what do you think was wrong with this? What would you have done differently? How do, like, what are your thoughts on this situation or this, situ this scenario? Yep, and even looking at the just adults in this situation, what do you think some barriers may have been for Ava um, in this situation? What support could you offer as a parent if, you know, Ava was under your care? Um, what values come up for you also is something to be considered. What values, you know, does it bring up for you as far as 
parenting and, and the age of when people are prepared to be a parent, if that exists, um, things of that nature. Feel free to share in the chat or unmute yourself and talk openly. Since we're down to our last few minutes, I'll offer um, when it comes to provider relationships, um, like we mentioned earlier, we want to empower our teens and as well as ourselves to seek providers that are unbiased and that are patient centered. And when we say patient centered, you know, we want providers that are focusing on kind of what decisions you're making for your life and, and what you what your pregnancy intention is, we refer to it as far as like when you feel like you want to start a family, how you feel like you want to start a family. Um, it's not the provider's job to tell you how to make those plans or what those plans should look like. It's the provider's job to provide you support in making the best plan that you have for yourself. Um, so some barriers clearly were that her gynecologist was just kind of trying to dissuade her decision um, from wanting to, to conceive. And it's okay to have a conversation about what parenting might look like for a young person. But even when we have teens that call our hotline, there are plenty of them that are like, I'm 18 and I think I'm infertile because I had sex twice in the past month and I'm not pregnant and tell me what I have to do. And it's not our job as counselors to tell them, no, you're too young to get pregnant. It's our job as counselors to help them kind of foresee what parenting and, and pregnancy will look like and help them make the best decisions for themselves by providing them support and information. So that's a big barrier. Um, and also just think about the kind of care that you would wanna receive as an adult. If my gynecologist told me this, it would be completely unacceptable. So um, it's one thing, you know, for family members to comment on that sort of thing, but definitely when you're in a professional situation, that's a huge barrier and enough to turn away a teen from care permanently. Um, we've seen that happen plenty of times where teens are just like, I'm never going back to that clinic. I'll just get pregnant and figure it out. So um, huge barrier. Okay, so for the sake of time, um, we're just going to go um, jump right into resources. So um, one of the resources that is available to the district for sexual health is the PASH program. Um, I mentioned earlier that we provide evidence-based curriculum, workshops, technical assistance, um, professional development opportunities for the whole district. Um, we also work very closely with 17 schools, and in those 17 schools, um, we work um, with the health teachers, nurses, school climate personnel, um, principals, as well as external um, partner organizations, organizations such as Access Matters. Um, I am going to drop a link in the chat, which will have handouts and um, materials with all of this information on there. You are more than welcome to shoot us out an email at PASH. P-A-S-H at philasd.org. And I will also have our hotline number or our info line number included um, in the handouts. We also have the ELECT program, um, which is an initiative that the district has to support pregnant and parenting students of any gender um, throughout the district. This program has been with the this program has been with the district since 1993. They offer case management, supportive services to expecting or already parenting students at um, 20 years of 21 years old or younger. Um, and it's to make sure that they succeed, that they meet their highest potential um, personally and academically to become successful parents and citizens. And I'll also have um, additional information about how to contact and reach them. So here's Access Matters information once again. Um, like I said, I know a lot of these activities went quite quickly and um, we may not have touched on um, all of the information, but hopefully you got some tools that'll be helpful as you begin to think about these conversations. But if you do need kind of more support, um, you can feel free to call our hotline number. It's right there. We do have interpreters available for folks where um, English may be a second language. 
Um, and we'd be happy to provide counseling to both parents and caregivers as well as teens. Um, and like I mentioned, it's all confidential. So we don't take any identifying information or anything like that. Uh, we can just have a conversation about the supports you need. And also, like I said, refer you to providers if needed. Um, there's also a text line. So if you just text Ask It Matters to that number, um, if you're more comfortable texting, um, that works as well. Also, as mentioned earlier, um, I had mentioned the health resource centers. Um, we partner with Access Matters to um, provide um, schools with, um, we help with the partnership of a local um, Title X provider. So I know like some of the ones that we work with is CHOP. Um, there's also, oh my goodness, there's one I can't, the one for Roberto Clemente. I'm just having brain press today. But we, we partner with several Title X providers to make sure that students can receive counseling and have access to testing um, and whatever they might need, whatever that looks like. Um, and it, that's that. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's the end of our workshop. We really appreciate you for being here. Um, let me drop that link for you to access um, our resources. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to um, the PASH team at pashatphilasd.org or access matters through their hotline. Are there any questions? Thank you all for participating and attending. And I hope we were able to provide you with some tools to start thinking about these conversations and feel free to reach out if you need additional help in the future. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, <laughs> so we want to thank you again, ladies, um, for you know giving us and providing our families out there um, this um, valuable um, information. And if you would like to rewatch this training and learn about future webinars, you're more than welcome to visit the FACT website at www.philasd.org um, backslash phase backslash FACT. And once again, um, we thank you, um, Natoya and Taylor, uh, for all of this information. And um, those families out there, you are more than welcome to view this training again um, on our FACT website.